Good evening, Jacques here from Mortgage Allies. It is another Tuesday and it's uh, beautiful. If I look up, I've got another screen up there. I'm not distracted um, at all. Um, it's another Tuesday. We get to spend some time with you um, going through another a webinar topic. So this is going to be a pretty interesting one. It's a kind of a niche program that we're going to cover with you. And I think you can actually um, enjoy it uh, quite a bit. Um, it shouldn't be as long as the last, uh, last month's. Um, so just as a reminder for you who've never been here, we do it on the last Tuesday of every single month. And uh, we are, um, we've been doing this for, gosh, almost two years now. So lots of topics there that you can certainly, um, you know, educate yourself about uh, uh, as well. So as we said, um, we, are we are talking about the owner occupied plus rental mortgage program. Now that comes like, okay, what's so unique about this thing here? Sounds like it's just another um, mortgage program. Well, not really, actually. This one really covers a niche that you do not get with any other program. So why? Because normally an investment property is a standalone. It's like investment, it stands completely by itself and um, it cannot really, um, you know, it, it, rental properties are by themselves. And you've got another one here, what's called principal residences. These two are not allowed to cross. You cannot let the two um, join each other, okay? So this program does something very interesting. It takes a residential um, a property or a prim, um, um, principal residence and investment property and combines them and it's legal, okay? We'll talk about the legal part in a second, okay? So you can buy it also, remember an investment property, you need to have at least 20% down. A principal residence property, you don't have to have 20% down, okay? So in this case, you can actually have a principal residence and include interest, uh, a rental income, and you can put less than 20% down, which is pretty cool. You'll see that in a moment, okay? And you can rent out all the units except for the one which you are going to be personally occupied, okay? You'll see how that comes together. So in other words, um, if there's two units, we'll talk about the units also, you have to occupy one, the other you can rent out. And so you're like, oh, that basement apartment, just hold your horses, we'll talk, we'll talk about that, all right? And you can also, which is really cool, you can use the rental income for mortgage qualification purposes. So as much as I'm not condoning it, you, you know, if you buy a house and you rent out the basement, you cannot, if it's not a legal conforming blah, blah, blah basement, you cannot use that rent to qualify for the mortgage, okay? That's kind of your business, so to speak, okay? And lenders don't really like that. So I'm just saying to you is um, under this program, you can actually legally use that rent to, to help you qualify for the mortgage, which is really cool, okay? And what's also cool is you qualify under owner-occupied mortgage guidelines. Now, you may not, if you go through a few of the older webinars you will see, it, there are very different rules for investment properties and very different rules for um, permanent residence properties, right? So your house where you live in. And these are slightly more relaxed. The rates are also better for these. And these are a little bit more tight and the rates are higher for those. So you kind of really, you kind of, I call it the have your cake and eat it program, right? It's, it really gives you um, everything in one. Okay, so here are some of the requirements, uh, you know, for owner occupied plus rental properties. Now, let me throw some disclaimers out there. Like there is no ways I can tell you every single nuance that you need to be aware of in this program, okay? So give me some license there. Um, otherwise you're gonna fall asleep if I unpack them all. But here are some of the big rocks that you need to be knowing. The property must be residentially zoned and only residentially zoned. Okay, very important. We'll chat about that a little bit more in a moment. And it can have, not have more than four units. Very important also, all right? And all units must be legally zoned. Okay, so let's talk about that. So I got a house here 
and I'm deciding to live in the top or I'm deciding I'm single and living in the bottom and I'm renting the top out. Is that a legally zoned unit? No, it is not, okay? So it's literally, when we look at the listing, it's gotta say duplex, triplex or fourplex, okay? In some cases in Toronto or in some cases in other cities, you will have what's called a legal um, basement. Now that legal basement has got a lot of documentation. It's got to be city um, approved. It's got to be fire department approved. It's got to be properly retrofitted, et cetera, et cetera. Then we can potentially use it. And even that, some of the mortgage insurers and lenders are a little bit twitchy about that. So don't go to, to um, don't, don't depend too much on that, okay? But if it's legally zoned, Absolutely. All right. And here with the residentially zoned, uh, cannot be, uh, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of exclusions at the end, but it cannot have any commercial components in it. So a lot of people are like, oh, I love this idea because I can have like three residential units up here. Okay. And then there's a commercial one at the bottom. No, nope, you can't have, it cannot have any commercial component in it whatsoever. Okay. That's very important to know. All right. And of course, as I said, you must occupy one unit at least, okay, it must be owner occupied by the purchaser uh, and was on the, the purchase agreement. Remember also in Canada, we work like this, whoever's on the purchase agreement, which we call the agreement of purchase and sale, the APS, must also be on the mortgage, must also be on the title, okay? Right, so that's important. Now we can talk about holding companies and all that kind of stuff, but in personal names, that is how it flows through always is that way, okay? So I'm throwing a lot at you, I'm very much aware of that. So hopefully this is kind of, let, let it sit for a bit so you can marinate it and kind of um, think through that one. But let's look at this program. So I'm gonna say this in kind of sentences because it's a lot. Why is this such a great program? It's because in a nutshell, it is the only residential program that you can get for less than 20% down payment, okay, in other words, insured, and allows the borrower to purchase a principal residence with less than 20% down payment, as I said, with leg and legally rent out a part of the property, qualify under uh, principal residence mortgage guidelines, and use some of the rent to qualify for their mortgage, okay? It's normally either or, either it's a principal residence can't rent it out or a rental property here. We've combined both and you can, if as long as you buy for below a million dollars, you don't have to put 20% down. Okay, you can put 20% down, but you don't have to. Now that's pretty cool, all right? So, um, and, and I'm hoping some of you already see the opportunity here of where you can go with this, right? Now there's a few drawbacks which we'll ch chat about in a, in a minute also. Okay, so here are some of the, the greater requirements here. And so number one is one unit must be owner occupied. Okay, as we talked about already, okay? So um, this is an owner occupied uh, um, uh, and so property. So a pure investment property, like I'm never gonna live there. I'm just gonna rent it out. Or if it's a three or four plex, or plex investment, dedicated investment property are not eligible, does not fall under this program, okay? As I said, the property, the, the property must be 100% res residentially zoned, cannot be in any way um, have any com commercial component in it. This is a pity, but I understand why, because there are so many you know, work live units, right? Um, but no, those don't fall under, they are excluded from this program. And no more than four units we talked about as well, all right? And so here's what we said earlier, the units must be legally conforming and fully self-contained units. That's a new one I haven't said yet. All units must meet municipal zoning criteria and be fully self-contained. So what does it mean? So that, you know where this goes, right? This says no rooming houses, okay? So <laughs> no student, student houses, 10 bedrooms and one kitchen, that doesn't cut it, okay? So it's excluded from this program, all right? And any one and two unit uh, um, uh, properties fall directly under the residential mortgage guidelines or residential principal residence guidelines. Okay, so what is the minimum down payment for um, a principal residence under a million dollars? 
it is it is this it is five percent let me put my red pen in there i feel like a teacher five percent of 500 of the first five hundred thousand dollars okay that is the minimum requirement okay then for properties that are let me squeeze it in here between 500k okay and a mil and below a million dollars very important okay so less than a million dollars okay we calculate it like this it's still five percent of the first five hundred thousand dollars and then 10 percent of the difference between the property value below a million dollars and five hundred thousand dollars so let's do some math here let's just say we have a property of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars purchase price it's five percent of the first five hundred thousand dollars which is twenty five thousand dollars okay then it's 10% of the amount above $500,000 and below a million dollars. So it's $750,000 minus the $500,000, which is $250,000. We take 10% of that, we, which is then $25,000. We add the other $25,000 to it, and we got $50,000 minimum down payment. Okay? I hope you flew with me there. All right? So that's how we calculate. This follows that down to the T. Okay, it doesn't deviate from it at all. Now, here's one nuance for you to know. A four, a three, or a fourplex property, okay? A three or fourplex property, the minimum down payment, if you're buying below a million dollars, is 10%. So it does not follow this, okay? It does not follow that. It says, even if that property is worth, good luck trying to find that in, in, in the GTA these days, even if that property is worth $300,000, you still have to put a minimum of 10% down, okay? And of course, if you go a million or above, then it is 20% down. So this is what I didn't say here. If any property, um, if you go a million and above, it is 20% down, minimum. Now, be very careful. There comes a sliding scale, which kind of will just hurt your head. Some banks, in fact, all banks, once you go above a certain level, they determine that level. So here's a good example. Some banks will say, once you go at a purchase price above 1.5 million, they'll say they want 20% of $1.5 million. And then let's just say 50% of, of the purchase price above $1.5 million. So don't be careful. It's very easy to fall into the trap. Oh, it's just 20% above a million dollars. It's not true. Their uh, banks uh, charge a sliding scale to offset their risks once you go above a million dollars. All right. So there's a lot of um, extra information there. Okay. So what are some of the benefits of the program here? Okay. So I want you to think for a second, you know, um, how you could use this. And we'll see some very clear benefits in a second. You've got a very clear benefit. You've got a principal residence that you can use rental income to qualify, which is phenomenal, okay? And you qualify at um, a principal residence rates and criteria. So easier to qualify, lower interest rates for sure, okay? And you don't have to put 20% down, obviously, if it's below a million dollars, right? Which is very cool. You get increased purchase power, which you'll see in a second also. And this is big. You'll see, I'll do an example for you in the end here, is that that extra rent that you're getting obviously offsets your home ownership costs, right? That goes directly against your um, the cost of, of owning your property. Now, obviously there's some costs that you add too. Like whenever you've got a rental um, uh, property in your, in your um, portfolio, you know this cost associated to that property that you may not have with a principal residence. So yeah, there are additional costs also, but net net, you should be better off. Okay. And uh, we, as I say here, the increased purchase power, let's just say somebody is only able to buy a property of X. Now they're able to buy a property of X plus, especially in this market. That is so important. All right. Um, so although this program may not be for everyone, it is definitely, um, um, and the other problem is, as I said, is it's not easy to find these problems. I've, I've, I've never figured this out. Like this is such a niche and amazing program. Why is it that in today's market that developers are not jumping on board and building two, du duplex, threeplex or fourplex properties? Because I think they'll be scooped up, you know? And people would, uh, you know, they'll buy any, anybody who doesn't have a big family, um, you can certainly do that. You can imagine 
if you you know you're you're a, maybe a couple or or a, or a single person, you go buy a property like this. You live in it for three years. Um, you save money. You buy yourself another uh, principal residence, and you rent this out. You get an instant rental property. And obviously, the benefit of any property uh, that has more than one unit is, let's just say, it has four units, and this is owner occupied. Well, guess what? If you move out here and you rent this out. The benefit of having something like this, this is your, your risks are mitigated. Like if you use lose one tenant here, okay, then you still got three that cover the, the, the cost, which is very, very good. Where with a single family um, property, you know, if you lose the tenant, you've got nothing. You're going to like either zero or zero, which is not good. Now, be careful what I just said, because the single family um, homes are not included in this program because you cannot rent out the basement, right? Okay. Um, so this is definitely a good solution for a, for a person who's a first time home buyer who is trying to get into the market for sure. Now, as I said, good luck trying to find that, you know, for a million dollars or below in Toronto or, or Oakville or something like that, you're probably not going to get it, but you probably have a good shot at it aside on, on the rooms of the GTA or some of the, the cities on the outside. I think that would be, um, be possible. And also somebody who wants to reduce their home ownership expenses, especially if somebody's nervous, like, oh, I don't know what the rates are gonna do. I really wanna make sure I'm protected. This is it. This would be a very, very big help. Okay, so this is where we're gonna quickly go into an example. So we covered a lot of things and I'm gonna kind of tie it all down for you with an example. So first thing I'm gonna cover on here, I'm not gonna to go too much in depth here is, remember there's a stress test to that, right? And that stress test is the same whether you buy a rental property, whether you buy a principal residence, whether you buy a property under this program, it's exactly the same. But here's where it changes, okay? If you buy a principal residence or a property under this program for below a million dollars, you can put between five and 10% down as I explained. You do get to only go to 25 years, but you get the best rates in Canada. That's very important that. Okay, now if you buy a dedicated rental property, okay, see here, look what happens. You get, you know, not double rates, but you get like a 0 0.4, 0 0.5% increase in rate over a principal residence, okay? So it could be higher. So there's a definite benefit over this also. Uh, uh, sorry, so this is a different ben benefit over buying it as a rental property. So very, very uh, cool to know that. All right. I've done an example here. Let's see that. Hopefully this is big enough for you. I've done six columns here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how it compares. I'm going to, we're going to go from the left-hand side all the way to the right-hand side. Okay. So column number one, I'm using minimum down payments here. This is if somebody buys a principal residence and they're going to live in it. They're not going to, it's a single family home. It's not a, um, owner occupied plus rental property at all. It's a straightforward house, okay? And I'm using my two favorite people, Gary and Susan, and Gary makes um, 65,000 and Susan makes 65,000. So you see, I haven't used like crazy um, incomes. I've used kind of realistic incomes. Also remember that the maximum your TDS can be, or your GDS can be is 39 and 44. And you're like, what is TDS, GDS, Jacques? It's right here. That's your TDS. That, that big monster formula here, and it is defined right there, okay? So that's what these, uh, these um, I'm not gonna go through the actual formulas themselves, but that cannot be more than 44%, and this cannot be more than 39%. If somebody has debt, they are gonna be limited by their TDSR. If somebody has no debt or very limited debt, they will be limited by the GDSR, okay? All right. So let's see what happens. So in this case, you can see here, we're kind of very close to 39%. If um, Gary and Susan want to buy this house with a minimum down payment, they can buy a house for $646,000. And I hear you out there snickering, like, good luck with that, buddy, trying to find that house. And I go, yep, you got a good point, all right? Um, I'm laughing with clients, not at you, because I get it. I mean, I got so many clients who are like, I make very good money and I'm really, really pissed off. I can't buy a house in my own country. I totally get that. I really do. Okay. And so this maybe will give you some hope. Okay. So now Gary and Susan go, no, no, no. Same income. You see, I've used exactly the same income for them right throughout the, the sheet here. 
okay? Here we say, okay, they're buying a duplex this time and I'm just guessing a rent of $800. They charge $800 of rent for that unit. It's a legal duplex, conforms to everything and their minimum down payment is um, $42,000. Now you watch here, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite throw a party because my purchase price went up by, you know, $22,000. That's not a lot. Because remember, watch up here, we use only 50% of the rent. We add only 50% of the rent to the personal income. That's why it's below the line under, under the denominator, okay? So it's not gonna make that big a difference, but here is the kicker, watch. This is their total cost here. Watch here, all of a sudden these guys have got $678, obviously assuming 100% efficiency, which is a dangerous thing to do, but what can I do? I don't have any other numbers to work with. Assuming 100% efficiency, no additional costs, they have $678 a month extra in their pockets over these guys and look at the difference of payment. Not much of a difference. So their ownership is significantly less compared to these people here. Now watch, when, when Gary and Susan decide to go buy a triplex, okay, look what happens. All of a sudden, the minimum down payment jumps to 10%, legal minimum down payment jumps to 10% right away, okay? And so not, again, not a massive difference, but slightly increased. And really the difference is only because of the down payment increase, okay? But again, look at the payment that we'd have to pay for this property. Now we're also getting more into a more realistic kind of uh, house price in, in the 700 zone. But look what down here, this is really cool. Look at, now again, it's two years, so remember, a duplex, I used only one rent because the one unit has to be occupied by the owner, okay? Here, I've used a threeplex, but one unit has to be occupied by the, by the owner and two units can be rented out. So two times $800, I'm assuming the rent, same rent for all of the units, $1,600. But the key here is this, here they are better off by $1,350 a month. So you take the 2858 and all these other things, these obviously remain the same, the property taxes and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, uh, property taxes, since I don't know what the property looks like, I always assume 0.7% of the property's value until I have a listing where I can see the actual property taxes, okay? So you can see that there's a massive difference in change into uh, the, um, the, what do you call it, the, the ownership costs. Okay, so here, now let's say they're buying a fourplex and very predictably, you can see the price doesn't increase too much, 739, but now I got three units that are rent out and this is pretty cool. Like, look at this, 2023 extra cash flow. That means they're really buying a house for almost $900 a month. That is pretty cool for 739, okay? So that's very sustainable in pretty much most people's books, okay? Which is cool. All right, so, um, this is what this is. These are what we call the DPS stands for down payments, so the minimum down payment. Okay, all of these here. Now, if Gary and said, no, 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 look, we we actually going to go and put twenty percent down. Now, something very cool happens. There's the twenty percent there. Okay, but they can go to thirty years now, where these folks here, Gary and Susan, they could not go more than twenty five years. Now you can see that price goes up very nicely to to nine oh eight. They still have four, the four units, they occupy one, and you can see there, they're getting three times 800, $2,400 a month. And you see, again, look at the cost of ownership here. It really is like $800 a month they own this property for, which is pretty neat. Um, and so you can, you can just see if they rent out one more unit, it's, it becomes um, cash flow neutral at the very, very least. Okay, so that should, like there is no other program like this, okay? You, they, you cannot do that as an owner occupy. You cannot owner occupy and get rent other than this program, which is very, very neat, okay? The last one is, I hear some of you saying, oh, Chuck, that's ridiculous. Why don't I just go and buy a rental property instead of living in it? Pay I've paid 20% year all anyway. So I'm just going to buy a rental property. You know, if I'm staying with, you know, I'm staying with my mom and dad's basement. I'm saving money like it's going out of fashion. Why would I just go, not just go live with my mom and dad's and rent out all four units a year, you say, okay? And I go, I got it. Now here's what you gotta remember. And this is what people don't really know. In Canada, it works like this. 
if you do not own a principal residence yet, okay, and you want to buy a rental property, okay? There, see the yellow here? There's something called the shelter cost, okay? And so banks will say, well, you don't have a principal residence yet. Um, and you go, well, I love my mom and dad. I didn't really pay rent there. Even if you don't pay rent, banks will put kind of um, weight your application with what's called a shelter cost. At the very least, you're gonna be in for a $500 per month shelter cost, not in real terms for uh, mortgage qualification purposes, okay? Now, in this case, if I said, okay, no, um, you know, Gary and Susan are saying, no, 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 we, we, we're renting, uh, we're renting a condo somewhere, we, we pay $1,800 a month in rent there, and we wanna stay in that condo, we love it in that condo, but we're gonna rent the whole unit out. Now, I actually have to use the actual rent that Gary and Susan pays as a liability. And you can see that is obviously quite punitive, okay? And so you can see now there's four units. Uh, they are not, it's now a, a full um, rental property here, see there, okay? And they're renting all four units out at $800 a month. Well, watch, I can go to no more than 43% and look at my maximum purchase price, okay? It's 702. So. What's the conclusion? The, co the conclusion is if you are living somewhere and you're renting right now and you're prepared to live in the property in one unit and rent three units or the other units out, you're probably gonna be better than if you can continue renting or live with you know, mom and dad's basement or wherever you live, then, you know, um, then just, yeah, you're gonna be better off if you owner occupy and rent the other units out, okay? So, I think it's a great niche in today's market and I'm really surprised why people are not talking about this more often. Now, again, you know, this, the sad thing is we can talk all we want, but you're probably gonna have to go to the outer areas of the GTA to actually find a property like that um, for it. But I've, hopefully this gives you hope. I'm trying to look for niches to help my clients to own real estate and own it in a sustainable way. I'm very humbled and very thankful to say that in the 15 years we've been doing this, not one of my clients have ever lost their homes. And that's important to me because you're supposed to own real estate. Real estate's not supposed to own you, okay? So sustainability is a big deal for us, okay? Just so you know, you can imagine this year, this, this ratio has everything to do with qualification, but has nothing to do with your budget. Like there's no gas in here, there's no food in there, there's no Florida holidays in here. So if you barely qualify in this quali under this ratio, you know, you're going to have to be careful, okay? So it doesn't determine affordability. It only determines qualification. So that's pretty much it. Um, I just kind of put this in here to, uh, to say you would really want us to take you through a pre-qualification process before you jump into this so that you can be pre-qualified and ready to, uh, to execute on your plans. Okay, I want to just point out one last thing here, and then we are done. You guys are so awesome. Um, all right, so here are the properties that are ineligible. They cannot be used under this program. So in investment property, so as I said, a 100% rental property is not eligible under this program, okay? Secondary homes, if you look at our webinar before, a secondary home is I use a cottage. And so you cannot buy a cottage and say, oh, I live in the top and I rent the bottom out. That's illegal because that program used to be like that, but people use it and fraudulently used it by saying, oh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's gonna be for my cottage, but they, act, they, rent, they, both rent, they rent both units out. So the government's like, done, we're not using that anymore, okay? So a secondary cottage is, is a, a prop, home is like a cottage or a house you buy for your kids for university, or let's just say you travel to Vancouver for business, but you don't wanna stay in a hotel there, you buy a condo for yourself to live in or your mom and dad are aged and you want them to live right next to you to take care of them. That's a secondary home, okay? Single family dwellings are also ineligible for the owner occupied plus rental program. Why? Because you cannot rent out the basement, okay? That's not a legal unit. Now, as I said, there are exceptions to it, but as a rule, be very, very careful about that. Okay, so the other one is no commercial properties. Okay, cannot have any commercial component in it whatsoever. 
and any property that's more than four units. So in other words, if you have a you know block apartment block with 20 units, you can't use it for this. That's a multi-residential um, program. And any borrowed down payments. Now um, you cannot use that under this program. So if you have a home equity line of credit on another property, you may borrow from that, but you cannot use it from an unsecured loan. So you can't go to your bank and get a line of credit and use it for down payment for that. That's not allowed, okay? And this rooming houses, as I said, student homes where there's like 10 students in one kitchen, it does not work for that. The next one, I made a slight error here. Um, it's called rental pools, okay? So you cannot use it for that. So, you know, you like you're part of a rental pool or like hotel units downtown, it's not, they're not eligible for this program at all. And of course, timeshare properties also, any of those kind of outlying properties are not, um, they are not eligible under this program at all. So um, just to kind of give you an idea what we're doing next, um, next webinar. And so this is always a question that people struggle, okay, is, Oh, HELOC stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. Okay, you get a mortgage, you can add a line of a home equity line of credit to it. Okay, that is attached to your property. It's registered against the property. Okay, so people say to me, well, is it better to have a home equity line of credit or should I just take cash out and put it in my wherever I'm going to put TFSA or something like that? Okay, and so that's a, always the million dollar question that people ask. And so we're going to answer that question. Hopefully, I'm going to point out a bunch of pitfalls here. Okay. There are, I'll let the cat out the bag just a little bit. There are less pitfall years, but nevertheless, there are. Okay. So we're going to address that question for you next time because a lot of people will say to me, Jack, uh, I want to home equity line of credit. And not like I'm trying to mess with people's lives. I go, why do you need, you believe you need a home equity line of credit? Okay, and a lot of people will say, oh, I need it just for security purposes. And I go, okay, let's, let's look at that and if that's good for you. And I will stay mom from that point of view. We will discuss that question. I think you get a lot of value from that and it'll actually give you a lot of clarity why HELOCs are a great tool for banks to keep you in a mortgage, okay? So we'll chat about that next time. Well, honestly, I really want to thank you so much for your time and for taking the time to, 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 to hang out with us and chat about mortgages. I hope it's been, been great and helpful to you. Uh, we see you at the end of summer. I can't believe it. Like, that's quite depressing. Like, we got one month of Canadian summer. That's like, I think I'm going to go right now and leave here and go do something outside just for the sake of it. Thank you so much. Have a great night and see you on the other side. Bye-bye.